Connection is key for the Death, Dying, Diagnosis and Doulas podcast. If we speak to you and people that work in your space, reach out for a collaboration. Julie at doulaconnections.com.au Welcome to the program, Wendy Hall from Dementia Doulas International. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Great. I'm really Good. excited to have you on here because I've never heard of a dementia doula and I want to hear all about you and how you ended up doing what you're doing and how you're going to change the world. So first up, tell me a little bit about your background and, and how you started to, you know, or started your business as dementia doulas. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about it. Um, I guess it starts back, I have a history as a registered nurse and also as an on-road paramedic from many, many years ago and worked in aged care, um, yeah, quite a few years ago. And then um, I guess I started to want to really work in a more proactive area. So I moved into the area of dementia more specifically about 15 years ago. And over the years, I, I was just so blessed to be able to work with people who were newly diagnosed through to that end stage and then still supporting um, family members um, post, you know, the person passing away. And I always felt like there was a real gap at the end of life that I, you know, I'd had the opportunity to work in palliative care many years ago. And I just really felt like there's, there's no one there um, really tailoring and specialising services for people with advancing dementia. And so it kind of bugged me for quite a few years. And then I um, kind of got to a point in my career where I kind of was seeking out something that, that might be able to fill that gap. And there's a lot of good courses and um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, mainstream services there. Quite often people with advancing dementia will end up in a, in a aged care home um, where they get quite generalized services. So they, they may get good service, but they don't get, tailored palliative care services like anyone else with a uh, life limiting disease uh, or illness would would get so it kind of put me on a path to find and create a new model for that that space and um I guess uh, opportunity kind of put me on a path where I came across the end of life doula model and kind of went, um, although it doesn't fit perfectly, uh, I think I found my, my foundation. Wow, that's beautiful. So when you look at the difference between an end of life doula and a dementia doula, what's, what's the main difference or differences? Um, probably uh, one of the main differences, well, two of the key elements for me that really differentiated the two roles was that uh, I, I guess in a, with an end of life doula, quite often you're connecting with someone in those final uh, 12 to 18 months, for example, whereas someone uh, with a diagnosis of dementia is effectively facing a life limiting disease from their time of diagnosis, which could be anywhere up to 10 years. Mm. So that's, there's a different relationship there to be formed and it's not necessarily a short one. Um, the other key element for me was that generally with an end of life doula or when I've worked in the palliative space, quite often you're able to, to connect and still talk to the person um, unless obviously they're, they're for whatever reason unable. Um, mm. They're still able to express what their wishes are up until, uh, you know, very close to the end. Whereas someone with dementia loses their voice very, very early on. So it's very much about trying to capture that voice and empowering and positioning families as early as possible. So if, if I was somebody that had an early diagnosis of dementia, would I connect with you now or, or is it later? Like what do you suggest? Ideally, it would be now. Um, reality is that quite often it'll be, much, it'll be later in the person's progression. But having said that, I think just having, I guess, been up and running for the last couple of years now, um, I, there's a lot of awareness from um, people. I, I'm getting referrals from people who are newly diagnosed that are feeling quite lost and not sure what their starting point is. So mm. um, the earlier, the better. While the yeah. person can still talk and connect, 
Um, but that's not a, it's not an easy thing to do in the earlier stages, as you can imagine. Yeah. Cause it sounds uh, like really scary, you know, to, to have a diagnosis of dementia and then have insight into that. So what would you, how do you, how do you talk to people in that circumstance? I think it's keeping it real. And unfortunately, what I've seen over the years with people that are newly diagnosed with dementia is from time of diagnosis, um, the day before they get the diagnosis, they're probably someone who's still, you know, they're living in the community, they're potentially working, uh, supporting a family, but having a few issues with their memory. And then when they get a diagnosis, they can all of a sudden do nothing. Mm. Um, the disease hasn't done that. That's a knock to someone's self-esteem and their confidence. And I think society as a whole plays a big part in that and our own pride and ego. Um, we don't like to show our, our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. And someone with, uh, that's nearly diagnosed, diagnosed with dementia, they know what comes with that. They know the stigma attached to that and they know how people will think of them or they will perceive how people will think of them. Mm. So it is very hard to connect. So it's about keeping it real and helping them still like, feel like they're a valuable member of society. Yeah. Okay. So look, a lot of us are, don't really understand dementia in detail. So, you know, we hear the word dementia, but they're all different types, aren't they? There is. So there's over a hundred different types and that's a big issue as well that we still face from a, from a health and aged care perspective is that even though there are over a hundred different types, we still bundle it into the same basket and call it one. And imagine doing that with all the different cancers that there are. Imagine saying, why waste our time trying to really hone in on the individual cancers? Let's just call it cancer. Um, if you did that, it would mean that everyone would get the same treatment and management plan. Um, there would be no individualising the services that they actually need. And that's a big issue in dementia. That's, that's such a great way to describe that, you know, to, to the comparison because every book, because cancers, as we know, I mean, they're all completely different and different trajectories in how that works. And so dementia exactly. is similar to that. So some people experience sort of quick uh, progression and others it's a decade or more is that right uh it's so individual and again it depends on yeah how what type of dementia the person has and how it's manifesting within the brain it's a very physical disease it's not like a mental health issue where uh we're looking more at chemical imbalances so if you looked at the brain of someone say for example who had schizophrenia their brain tissue actually would probably look quite healthy but if you look at someone with dementia, if you look at their brain, um, there is actual, the, the brain cells are, are dying. They are breaking mm. down. So depending on how that manifests for the individual is how they would be affected by, by the disease. Mm, okay, then. I noticed in your bio, you mentioned that you didn't, you know, part of their overall objective was that so that people didn't go it alone. What do you mean by that? And does that also mean the family and say if people are in an aged care facility, how you support the staff as well? So what does that actually mean? Definitely. It's, it's, very, it's all encompassing. And I have a background as well. In, so I, I actually do dementia training for staff in care homes. And my, my realisation over the years is that uh, care staff as well-meaning and as wonderful as so many of them are just aren't equipped to really provide that tailored type care and get everyone on the same page. Mm. So it is about the person themselves. It's about family. It's about staff. And it is about creating what the end of life doula might create in the community. You're trying to create that in quite often. Most times it'll be within a, a care home type environment. So when I say I don't want people going it alone, I've worked alongside too many people for too many years that although they are surrounded by a lot of people, they are still disconnected. They are still very much on their own and they still don't know how to actively play a role in the care of the person that they're supporting. Oh, I love that. So, so really the guts of what you're doing there as well is keeping the person connected to themselves, their community, to their environment. Is that what you mean by that? Because it's a great concept. To, you know, I love that, that thought of people just keeping connected right through the whole process. Yeah. And when I started nursing 
30 years ago, um, there was very much still the attitude of, uh, you know, someone with dementia, the lights are on and no one's home. And it was such a common phrase that we would hear. But then when you work closely with someone with dementia, you kind of go, but there is someone in there. Like, they may be trapped in there, but there's still someone in there. And anyone that's worked or supported someone with dementia, that'll really resonate with them. So it's about keeping that connection and keeping that person uh, alive in a way that others can connect with. Because again, quite often we, our everyday relationships are very much based on face value. If I talk to you, you'll talk to me back. If you don't, then I'll either think you haven't heard me or you might be ignoring me and you might not like me. So I might just walk away from you. And the person living with advancing dementia doesn't have those social type connections uh, or the ability to do that and to connect with people like. And so that leaves those of us that are outside of that realm feeling quite confused and feeling like there's nothing we can actually do. Wow. So, you know, I'm a, say I'm a, it's my mum that I'm worried about or my dad or my auntie or my uncle and and I'm listening to you talk and I've got concerns about somebody really close to me in my family because I'm starting to notice them forgetting and things that, and their personality may be changing. What would you say to them? Like how, how do you help families breach that gap between oh, there's something not right and I don't know what to do about it? The first point of call always has to be the GP. That has to be the starting point. And unfortunately, when there are issues with thought processes or memory, everyone automatically goes straight to dementia. Mm. And as soon as you go straight to dementia, the walls go up and quite often mum or whoever else it is will go, thanks, but no thanks, as most of us would do. So I think it's really important to highlight and rather than go straight to dementia, which everyone will do naturally anyway, is to really feel comfortable that there are so many other things that can actually cause um, changes to memory or thought, thought processes. So there's so much... So, so many other things that could be going on there. So um, it could be in an infection or dehydration or a nutritional deficiency. So there's so many things that could impact on that, that it's important that they're explored and treated as, as they need to be. Because I'm imagining there'd be people in that group that actually don't have dementia. They've got something that yeah. can be managed if it's got the right treatment by the right person early. Exactly. And you don't want a misdiagnosis of dementia. Or nah. uh, if it's left, um, people can end up becoming a lot sicker uh, because of those untreated things. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. So I also believe that you're an author. So do you want to tell me about mm. your books? Because um, we'd love I to am, hear. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So I finally released uh, Dementia Can't Take Everything this year. So that was a real uh, buzz to be able to do that. And it's something that's been in the, in the wings for quite a few years. And again, I just wanted a resource that was, that was real, that, that people could really connect with and um, yeah, get a real insight into how they can better connect with someone living with dementia. And uh, yeah, so at the same time, I've been writing the Dementia Dollar as well, which will hopefully hopefully be out uh, hopefully later this year. But yeah, it's not far off either. So the book that you have released, who's that for? Well, that's an uh, interesting question um, <laughs> because it was meant to be for staff. It was very much targeted to help anyone working with someone with dementia to really be able to connect. Um, but what I've actually had a lot of feedback uh, from families who have said that it basically has given them a voice and uh, a language that they can kind of share with others. So it's, it's helped uh, a lot of people be, to be able to, to be able to read the book and think, ah, that's how I can best you know, um, explain to others how I want them to connect with my family member. Yeah, because clearly, to be able to connect. yeah, because clearly there's some gaps there. I mean, I know that there's there's a lot of dementia services in Australia, but yours is mm. different, you know. So, what do you think the main difference is between what you're doing and what a, the, a lot of the other dementia type services and organisations are that are already available? I think what I'm trying to do is speak in a real language that, that people can connect with. And I think a lot of services are restricted in the way that they can connect with their clients purely based on uh, their funding streams and, and that they need to be um, everything to everybody in that space. Whereas for me, 
this role and my business is very much about we need to give we need to be about the person and the family and to be able to widen that network so that others will be able to uh, find it easier perhaps even to provide their services but also to highlight a gap in services so because we don't have that clinical kind of medical component that we are very much like a um, almost like a dementia navigator mm. I guess in a lot of ways it, it kind of is looking from the other side yeah yeah I love that oh god there's so many questions that are just going through my head <laughs> that you know that I want to ask you so so the next book tell me a little bit more about that and what gap that's going to fill well, I'm hoping that's pretty obvious that it is called the Dementia Doula. So it's about giving uh, dementia doulas a, 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 their own language and uh, an opportunity to, to, I guess, work out where things fit for them and how they want to, to connect with their clients or the people that they're supporting. Um, and to also be the individual. And I guess any of us that have worked in the medical area, uh, we come very much through a cookie cutter kind of, mm. you know, this is who you will be as a practitioner. And I want to really be able to, to um, instill in dementia doulas that they will offer something unique. They will offer something to their clients that, that I can't. And there'll be things that I can offer that they can't. But we will have that common foundation and a common language that we use um, because it's all about how we speak. Because we're effectively mentoring anyone and everyone to be able to feel comfortable in this space and to feel like they actually do have so much to offer the person. Mm. So with the training that you do with people with, uh, who are dementia doulas, like how do they fit into the puzzle of health, you know, healthcare, aged care? Like where do they work? Who employs them? Are they, in, like, are they working as individual businesses? Like what's the model? Yeah, so uh, we are still a relatively new concept. So again, things really launched for us uh, over the last year, 18 months, well, no, probably two years now. And of course, then we hit COVID. So a lot of doors were starting to open and then things obviously quickly shut. <laughs> so at the moment, um, there is certainly a lot of interest in, in the model around um, certainly um, having dementia doulas in care homes so that's kind of something we're still uh, navigating and really looking forward to being able to to bring that to fruition in the future. So yeah, at the moment, what we're seeing is those individual practitioners that are working with people in the community or supporting families who are supporting someone that is in higher care. Mm -hmm. So what are the main skills that you think are, are missing in health and aged care services for people that are working with people with a really probably more um, mid to end stage dementia, like where are the skill gaps, do you think? I think quite often it, it may not necessarily be about skills, but quite often it's about time and resources. So quite often there, like I meet the most amazing staff who would make me the most amazing dementia doulas, but they don't have time in the scope of the role that they already have. So I think to me, I, th I like to think of it in three kind of compartments that there is clinical care is already ticked. Yep. Um, that's already covered. Personal care is ticked, but compassionate care, there's a big gap. So mm. it's about filling that gap. And I know a lot of um, practitioners, whether they be care workers, whether they be registered, enrolled nurses, even doctors, that kind of think, you know what, I'm getting to a point where I'm a bit over that side of my career. I've loved it. I've enjoyed it. But what's next? And quite often the compassionate care is what attracted most of us to the industries that we work in in the first place. And it's the one thing that we don't have time to do. Mm. So it's kind of a catch 22 in that regard. Yeah. So the next question I wanted to ask you, I'm thinking about while you were talking about emergency departments and I imagine over the next, you know, few years as all the baby boomers are aging, there's going to be a lot more people coming into emergency departments with some stage of dementia. And realistically, they're also busy. Like how, how do we service people properly in those sort of environments when the staff are just so busy with what they're trying to do just to keep people alive? I mean, it's nearly like we need dementia doulas everywhere. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, firstly, the preference would be not to send people to an emergency 
department in the first place. Um, but I know that that's not always the case. But a lot of people do end up in the hospital system, not because they need to be, but because the people around them don't feel comfortable um, or feel like they are able to meet the person with dementia's needs. So that's a whole nother issue as well. So if we could reduce that number, that would go a long way to um, putting people in a situation where they're going to be disorientated, they're going to be more confused and distressed. Absolutely agree that every environment, wherever a person with dementia goes, that should be an environment where a dementia doula can provide support. So I totally agree. Um, we should be everywhere. We should ab absolutely be everywhere. And, and that also acknowledges how the role is very not, not uh, it acknowledges that the role is not about being part of the medical system. It supports and uh, provides that, almost that backup that the, the medical system needs, but it's not a good fit for where it mm -hmm. would exclusively, exclusively be. Yeah. So do you think that when you think about the health profession, do you think that there is enough training about dementia and how best to communicate or even how to, to like, what are the flags when you don't know anybody or know anything about them? And mm. you could be just working in a shop, you know, and somebody comes Ooh. in with some, with a, with dementia, like what are the flags for the public and for people? How do they, how do they get some idea that there's something that they might need to communicate in a different way? And how would you suggest they do that? Yeah, and I think a lot of people in the community can can spot when something's not right. So quite often people will see that someone's struggling. I think the older the person is, the more that uh, members of the community are more likely to think that perhaps it is dementia. And depending on that person's individual personality or background, they may be willing to step in and, and feel comfortable supporting that person. The unfortunate part is that there is uh, on the increase uh, younger onset dementia and we aren't programmed to see younger people aged under 65. So anywhere from 40, even younger, living with dementia. So if someone is exhibiting um, confusion or distress or even anger um, in a younger person, the community isn't necessarily gonna see that person as, as potentially having dementia. So um, I think anyone that feels really uncomfortable but can see that um, someone really needs support, it's just best to call an ambulance or even police just purely from a supportive perspective because police can then coordinate the right um the right path that mm. you know, the, the right services that need to come into play but i have done a lot of work over the years with um shop owners and community groups based on this very question and it's about again keeping it real and i think when it comes to communication whenever there is a shift in power as in, if I'm caring for someone, that puts me in a, in a power position, really. What usually happens is our voices change, and quite often, they start to go <laughs> up. And we start to say things like, are you okay? <laughs> and it's not my normal voice, and it's not the voice I would use for my closest friend. Um, but for some reason, we use it. And it, it really makes the person with dementia feel, they already feel singled out. They already feel conscious of... Um, and aware of the, that they are feeling different that, and that people are potentially looking at them. So to kind of come in with a, with a not, uh, it's a voice we use, I don't know why we default to it, but we mm -hmm. do. And it, it, I think it really puts even a bigger wedge between us yeah. and the person. Yeah. The more it's, that we can... Yeah, sorry. kick up. Sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> No, no. It, the more we can almost make the person feel like we're actually standing by their side, not in front of them trying mm. to pull them up, the more likely we are to have a connection with them. Yeah, because it almost seems like people, as and again, even when older people don't have dementia, there's all there's almost like this childlike way that people communicate with them. Like, what's your thoughts about that, and why do you think? that happens. I mean, you know, I could be 80 years old and like my mum, she's in her mid, mid eighties. She doesn't have any dementia, but I, I hear people mm. speaking to her in a, in a different way to what they would have 10 years ago. So what's your thoughts about that? Mm. I don't know. It's just something that we instinctively do. And again, um, my teenage son talks to me in that way. He talks to me like, 
I don't know anything. And it's, uh, <laughs> he uses this very condescending tone with me. Uh, it's something we just do when, when there's almost like it's perceived there was, there is a, there's an imbalance in power or it, it's just something that we naturally do. And it's something that particularly in the area of dementia, you have to actually really work on. And I know that years ago when I was really conscious of this weird voice that would come out, <laughs> and it usually has an upward infliction at the end. Yeah. Um, that I had to make sure that wasn't coming out of my mm. mouth. And quite often when we're working with older people or people who are unwell, quite often um, we, we try and slow down our, our speech so that they can hear or understand what we're saying. And when you slow down your speech, it, the natural default is for that voice to kick in. Mm. So rather than just slow it down, we start to say things like, are you okay? And it's weird. It's just a really, and it yeah. really lets the person know if, if I was unwell or injured and someone spoke to me like that, I would navigate that because I know I need their help and I can process that and go, you know what? I don't know why you're using this stupid voice, but I, I, I need you. Um, someone with dementia is in a bit of a different position because mm. they don't always perceive that they need help or care. But what we're good at doing is caring. So there is mm. the misfit, the mm. disconnection. Wow. It's been fascinating talking to you today. I'd love to invite you back again. So if there's if some of us would like to reach out to you, what would be the best way for people to connect with any of your information or buy your book or learn more about you? Um, how could they do that? Yeah. So all our information is um, on our website. So uh, dementia doulas, uh, dot com dot au and uh, the book is available through there it is also available through amazon and a lot of online book retailers but you can certainly go through uh, our website and then we can keep you uh, up to date with what's happening and um, when our next books are coming out so yeah <laughs> Lovely. Uh, also our course details are also all in there as well so uh, yeah thank great. you so much thank you wendy that's uh, wonderful and dementia doula the new thing thank you bye Absolutely. thank you bye are you confused about what your tomorrow might look like? Our doulas can guide you towards clarity, peace of mind and a plan for the future that will give you and your loved ones certainty. Enjoy your time together and minimise misunderstandings. Visit doulaconnections.com.au